Welcome to Season 3 of the M-W Tactical Podcast. Sit back and enjoy the conversations with the mad scientist and myself as we discuss the sport of shooting, goals, training, and everyday life. You are listening to the M-W Tactical Podcast. All right, good people. We're back at it again. And once again, I do want to say thank you for joining us for another installation of the M-W Tactical Podcast. Before we jump to business, I will say that this week's show is brought to you by Lucky Shot Firearms. My buddy Lucky Gray, who beat me in the Lucky Shot and M-W Tactical Challenge. So congratulations to Lucky. He is a stage sponsor for the 2021 South Carolina section taking place April 30th through May 2nd in Belton, South Carolina. So if you haven't signed up, please go sign up. And at the same time, go hit Lucky up on Facebook and flood his messenger and say congratulations. We want to shut his page down. Just everybody go tell him what's up. All right. Lock, so, lock his page down. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I do want to bring forth the co host the hostess with the mostest, the encyclopedia of gun knowledge, <laughs> my man that's fast on the trigger, my buddy, the mad scientist himself, Dave. What's going on, Dave? What's up, Mike? That was quite an introduction. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, I try to change it up every week. Try to keep it fun and engaging. Now, uh, if, if Lucky was sitting on the other side, it would be a lot more comical. <laughs> <laughs> you two yeah you two together are funny <laughs> oh yeah so um but i do want to say again thanks lucky for sponsoring this week's show and also being a stage sponsor for the 2021 south carolina sectional taking place at belton south carolina april 30th through may 2nd so how was your week uh weekend let's put it like that not the weekend was good. Weekend. Yeah. 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 We just finished our uh thanks long I had a I had a long break for Thanksgiving weekend. Okay. Um it was good. I had I had a couple extra days off. Got to spend some time with the family. Um that Friday went out to sharpshooters to set up for the match. Um the CSRA shooters match that following Saturday. No, I didn't shoot that match, but I witness the video that you posted and it looked a pretty damp out there <laughs> yeah well you know <laughs> it doesn't it hadn't rained in two or three weeks and then the night before the match it's gonna rain so yeah and you know how the, some some sometimes we get a heavy rain and there's some drainage issues that that show up at, at, at the range there but we have gravel in in most of the bays now and it really helped it it made it you know, to where it was functional. We could, we could use all the bays this time. We've had issues with some of the bays in the past, but just being too muddy and just too nasty to even try to use, but it, they're better now they're, they're getting better. They're still getting better. There's still some more work to do, but we were able to shoot a six stage match. And um, this particular one was our last match for the year. We, we normally don't do a match in December because of the um, holidays of Christmas and everything. So considering everything going on with the ammo crisis the holidays the weather i think we had a pretty decent turnout we had a little over 30 shooters 35 shooters maybe okay um, that's not bad turned out well uh, i don't think we had any dqs which is always good so nice. yeah <laughs> so now did you use more stages from travis or did you just randomly pick stages from a book so let's see, Travis designed two stages uh, from scratch, I believe. He saw a stage that Tim Heron posted on one of it, or, or it was a stage that he saw in one of Tim Heron's videos from the Area 2 Championship okay. that we, we, we set up or, and kind of mimicked. Um, and then I designed two stages myself from scratch and then we did a, a classifier oh, okay 
So it, it was kind of even between between Travis and I, and we had one from Area Two Championship. I got you. Uh, now, which classifier did you shoot? Nineteen oh one uh, high jinx, I think it's called. It was one from uh, that I shot in Utah uh, two years ago, or well, last year. Okay. Well, after the commercial break, we I want to go ahead and watch the video of that classifier if you actually recorded that one because for yeah, me yeah. you know like when i shoot a match i necessarily don't like to record myself shooting a classifier and the only reason i started doing that is i'm one of those superstitious type people so when i started recording myself that first time i went up and shot a classifier yeah i, I forgot to ask somebody to hold the camera you know to record me and ever since then, I've just been running with it like that. And then oh. when I did record a classifier, I didn't do too well on it. So I just went back to not recording the classifiers. So I went through, yeah, when I went through a period of time where the, the cameras, the recording was more of a distraction to me than it was worth. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I tried, I avoided it um, for, for a while. Now it doesn't bother me so much. So, so I'm trying to get some more video. Yeah. The cameras never bothered me because I actually look at the camera as a training aid and we would do that in the military. Also, like when we do training, we would videotape ourselves doing movements and then we'll go back, and analyze it. So I was already used to that aspect of it, but for me, it's not one of those type things the camera's on and you try to show off or anything like that it's natural movements just so you can use it as a yeah. learning tool it, well that that was my goal and it, and that's what i do with it now but mm -hmm. earlier on just just the physical act of remembering to turn on the cameras or place the cameras somewhere or, or do something with the cameras make sure they're rolling before i shoot that was a distraction it wasn't right. necessarily the, the recording myself it was just the i needed to be so focused on what i was doing with my shooting that right. i didn't i didn't need to worry with with the cameras and, and anything else but no, I I, i'm better with that now no, i got you i got you on that one so this week we have an interview with travis tomasi so we're going to talk to him about a little bit about his training and then also after the commercial break i do want to dive into the conversation that you said you want to talk about as far as training with Travis and other stuff that you've seen. Yeah. Um, Travis is, is a great dude. And I got to shoot uh, the national championship with him this weekend. He, or not this weekend, but uh, this year right. um, he's, he squatted with us and it was a blast to shoot with him. One of, one of the legends in our, of our sport. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. So let's let's go ahead and jump to a commercial break right quick and then we'll just come on right back and then we'll jump into the actual conversation that we want to talk about and let everybody hear what we're going to say about the, all this. All right. So if you will, just stay in your seats and here are a few words from our sponsors. Hey, this is Brian Conley at Hunter's HD Gold. If you've never tried Hunter's HD Gold, then I challenge you to find me at a match next year. Go to the website under scheduled events, find out where I'm going to be. Come meet me in person and demo a pair for yourself. Find out why shooters across the United States are changing to Hunter's HD Gold to get 43% more light to their eyes, better contrast, eyes that are not fatigued at the end of the day based on the, the colors that we use, and find out the real meaning of why they change so you don't have to. So check us out on our website, huntershdgold.com, and I look forward to seeing you at the range soon. JM4 Tactical has developed a state-of-the-art polymer holster that will quickly become your go-to holster. With high quality Hermit Oak leather, securely sewn to the interior of the molded outer Bolteron shell, your draw becomes silent and no more scratches up and down your firearm. When seconds count, you can rest assured that you will have the upper hand when you need it most. Whether you carry open or concealed, the Relic holster is available in four different models fitting over hundreds of different style guns. The new reliable, 
easy, light, individual carry holster by JM4 Tactical. Order your relic today at jm4tactical.com. Are you in the market to purchase your first or next firearm, but find the atmosphere of a gun store intimidating, crowded, or uninviting? There's a way for you to purchase the gun you want while avoiding the crowds, the gruff salesmen, and the marked up prices that come with a brick and mortar gun store. The process is called a transfer, where the purchase is made in an online store or it's sent to a federally licensed middleman called an FFL, who processes the paperwork and background check for a firearm purchase. CAE Transfers is the FFL with the lowest transfer cost in the Midlands at only $20 or $15 with the presentation of a South Carolina concealed weapons permit and $10 for repeat customers. If you live in Columbia, South Carolina or its surrounding areas, choose CAE Transfers as your FFL during checkout and let me help you complete your online gun purchase. You can find and follow CAE Transfers online at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using at CAE Transfers. Thank you for your business, and I look forward to seeing you soon. All right, good people. We're back at it again, and I do want to say thank you for joining us on the M-W Tactical Podcast. Now, before we went to commercial break, the mad scientist and myself, we were talking about his match at CSRA and a classifier that they shot. And the classifier was 1901 named hijinks. And I made the comment toward to him while we was on the break that I remember shooting this classifier. This was my first classifier I shot at Belton, but it was not used because something was off. Whereas it wasn't proper, however it was. But when I first shot it, I did it how I thought it would make sense. But then I was on the squad with Brandon Raider when we did it and the way he did it, it made perfect sense to me. So the way I shot it, I kind of, I think I started on the right side, worked my way left and then went to the other side and tried to shoot it coming in moving. Whereas when he did it, I want to say he went from the left to the right, hauled tail to the other side, and did the same thing, you know. Can you see the uh, diagram? Yes. Is it working? The share yeah. working? Yes, it is. Yeah, so this one it is uh, 19, 19, I want, it's from the 2019 uh, National Championship, and I, I, that's where I shot it. I flew out to uh, Utah, and this was the first time we shot it. it it's kind of deceptively easy <laughs> because you, you start anywhere you want within the shooting area you shoot three targets from the left side of the wall and then you shoot three targets from the right side of the wall but just like anything else with our with our sport you do it as fast as you possibly can and there's a penalty target on the outside uh, on the two outside targets so, so re really, the, the fastest way that you can shoot it is if you start on the outside corner, one of the outside corners, and, and then you shoot the target. Just, you know, just say you start on the, on the left side, you shoot the target on, um, closest to the wall. And then as you start moving, you move your way out. While you're moving, you engage that middle target on the left. And then while you're still moving, you're engaging this left target. And that is a partial target with a penalty target below it. So you're trying to engage that one as you're leaving, which is a very advanced skill. <laughs> so it's um, to, to shoot this classifier well, I mean, you really have to be on your game. And then, you know, if you're shooting left or right, you're coming – from the left side of the shooting area here. And then you're gonna come in, the first target that's visible is another partial target with a penalty target down below it. Again, you're shooting this coming into a position while you're still moving, which is a, still another advanced skill. And then by the time you know you finish engaging that one, you, you've moved far enough to the right side of the shooting area where these other two open targets are available. So it's those those two part or uh, penalty targets really change this stage. It makes it difficult, very difficult to shoot fast and shoot well with with good points. And that's where it kind of messed me up. I didn't quite get enough points. I shot it um, 
91.8%, I think, uh, through a delta somewhere. Um, trying to avoid one of these penalty targets. I had a delta. Just, just didn't get enough points on the stage. I shot it quick enough. I just dropped too many points on it. Yeah, I got you on that one. So I actually like that one. It comes across as being, like you said, very easy looking at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Six it's, targets. Yes, yeah, deceptive targets. just to run it, you know, so. And – Actually looking at it now in hindsight, after a conversation I had with Travis on the interview portion, yeah, I feel like off of something he stated to me that this one is a perfect skill to work on on one of the techniques that he, we were talking about. And we're going to talk about that in the interview. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, now, you did say you had the opportunity to shoot with Travis at National. So how was that overall? I did. We shot, uh, you know, like on our previous podcast, we, we shot three days at Nationals. And, uh, you know, we shot together all three days. And um, it was great. Travis is – it was the first time I've, I've really met him. I'm, I mean, I've known about Travis forever since – I mean, he's about the same time you were in AMU, but, um, you know, he was more focused on the pistol world. Um, but I've followed him forever. He is just, he's been one of the shooters that I've always looked up to when it comes to pistol shooting. He is just amazing. I think he has the fastest reloads period. I, I, I do believe. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know if that can be disputed. <laughs> we talked about that. Often. <laughs> I don't remember if I recorded that portion of the conversation, but I remember I was telling him that the first video I seen of him was him practicing reloads. And I don't know if it was like in the barracks or it was like in some type of a room, of course. And when he was doing it, it was like the magazine was going into the gun before the falling magazine. <laughs> yeah. You, frame. you don't see it. You don't really see him reload. It right. just and I was like, happened somehow. Yeah. But I, I just attributed <laughs> it to technology didn't catch up to his speed. <laughs> it's, it still has not. Yeah. Um, the, the human eyeballs have not caught up to his yeah. speed of the reload. Yet. <laughs> No, so no it was it was really great and um i talked to him a little bit you know after after the the end of the day end of the uh days we were shooting and and uh he was telling me that i was kind of uh helping kind of push him and motivate him to to want to try a little bit harder and he says he said that it was he he normally doesn't get that unless he's like shooting with the super squad right um and it was really cool because we we were talking about discussing stage plans when we came across some some weird uh stages you know where there were a couple different options we we were talking back and forth about you know should, should we do this should we you know should we do it that way or this way or, or what what are the you know considerations for for the stage plans here and it was he's a, he's a great dude and i really enjoyed shooting with him yeah well, I know he actually gave you accolades because he was saying he was, you know, honored to shoot with you. And he said the same thing that it pushed him and everything. But like I said, you'll hear it when we actually play. Uh, that's show. great. Um, that's great. Interview. So now one thing. When me and Travis talk, we always talk about the shooting aspect, but we dive in deeper, more into the mindset of how to prepare for movement and everything before the trigger is pressed. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's an interesting conversation. So, like I said, when we was at nationals, we talked for maybe 20 minutes on the side. And then when I talked to him over the phone, it was one hour, almost two, <laughs> you know? So was, yeah. I want to say it was like an hour and a half, to be honest. Then the next time I spoke with him, that was a four hour conversation. And well, yeah, you think I have a lot of knowledge, man. This what 
I haven't heard the conversation or the the interview yet, but he's he's done all this uh, for much longer than I have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it was very interesting um, talking with him. Now, I did want to ask you this, and this is something we spoke about, like when we're on the range together. And of mm-hmm. course, we all know mindset is very important when it comes to shooting. Yeah. So, what is your formula? for your mindset for shooting? Um, hmm. In, in what aspect? When, when I'm approaching a, a, a stage at a match or something like that? Yeah. So like when you walk up to a stage, all right. So say like it's the first stage. So after you register, you get all your gear on, <clears throat> you got your cart together. Now you walk to your first stage. Mm-hmm. Once you see the stage, what's the process that you go through as far as trying to get your mind right for that stage? So if, uh, if all has gone well with my planning before the actual match, I've, I've, I've been there, I've seen that stage, I've had time to develop a plan uh, of the way I want to shoot it or, or the way I think I want to shoot it. Uh, pretty well confident you know 90 percent that going into the stage before i get there for the actual match day or, or before you know before the actual squad's there and we're getting ready to shoot i've already got an idea of how long how i want to shoot that stage if there's any activators or uh you know moving targets some sometimes it it may my plan may change because you you typically cannot see moving targets or activator sequencing or things like that beforehand right um so so you know for the most part i know i know what i'm going to do when i get there um but at that point you know typically we get a three to five minute walkthrough period and i'm trying to drill in that original plan that i had when um whether i did it uh 30 minutes before or or the day before uh you know developing that stage plan it it was just like a light (laughs) plan development. I did not try to really ingrain it into my subconscious at that point, because I'm typically I'm looking at all the stages of the match at the same time. I just want to get a good overview. So next time I come back to the stage, I'm not blind. You know, I don't, I I know for the most part how I want to shoot it. And then stage or or match day, when I get there, I'm I'm trying to burn it into my subconscious. I'm going to go through, I'm going to make sure I find all the targets um, that that are there. I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm achieving the the correct round count um, as I'm going through the stage and, and counting my hits on each target. Um, you, you really sometimes I'll actually take a, I'll take a lap around the backside of the stage. Um, I'll walk outside of the, of the shooting area. Walk outside all all of the uh, walls and, and count the targets if um, you you look at the stage diagram and it will tell you how many targets are there how many shots that you know the, the course requires and i will walk around and i'll make sure i find all 12 of these targets that are supposed to be there or 15 targets or how many ever are supposed to be there and then i'll when i'm going through and actually like like dry firing the stage you know doing doing the walks through i'll make sure my shot count is coming out correct if I'm looking at a 15 target stage, you're going to have 30 shots on it. If I, if I end up doing my walkthrough and I have 32 shots on a, a 30 shot stage, something's wrong. Mm-hmm. I, there's either an extra target, like, because I've seen that before, like the stage diagram or, or this safety brief or not, I'm sorry, written stage briefing can be wrong. Mm-hmm. Maybe the, the target number was wrong or either I shot a target twice during my walkthrough. Right. I engage the target twice up, you know, so there's four hole, you know, theoretical holes in the target somewhere. So I go back through, you make sure all that stuff matches up because if it doesn't, some, something's wrong somewhere, either the written stage briefing is wrong or you counted a target wrong or you engage the target twice. I make sure all that stuff makes sense. All the numbers match up. And then once I'm confident in that, I, I just repeat it. Um, and I'm looking, I do, a, 
I've, I've visualized the stage as many times as I can. Um, but I start kind of at a, at, at a broader spectrum of visualization. And then the more times I do it, the, the tighter I get with my visual, visual visualization. Um, and, and by that, I mean, I'm looking at, or initially I'm just looking at targets in my, in my mind. I'm picking out a target here, target here, target here. I need to move this position, target here, target here, target here. I need to reload here, target here, target here. And then the more times I go through it, then I'm looking at two shots here, two shots here, two shots here, two steps back, you know, transition to this target, two shots here. And then I'll go through it again. And then I'm looking at alpha zone. Hmm. Mental, this is all mentally. I'm, I'm doing all this, you know, as many times as I can. And then I'm looking at alpha zone here, alpha zone here, alpha zone here. Maybe if there's a partial target, like on this diagram we looked at um, for the classifier, I may not be looking at the center of the alpha zone like I would on an on open target. I'm looking at the center of the available target area, which may not be the center of the alpha zone. So that's what I try to, I try to visualize that where I'm actually going to transition my eyes to my sight to on each target as I go through the stage. And once I get down to that point, once I'm visualizing the center of the available target area, that's what I, that's what I start duplicating at that point. Um, I've got my movement figured out for my previous walkthroughs. I kind of let that my movement go into subconscious and then I'm just visualizing the center of the available target area on each target. And I do that as many times as I have, you know, time for. And, and that just depends. The, the number of visualizations just depends on the shooting order. Uh, you know, I may only get like 10, 15 times to do it, or I might get 30 or 40, you know, if I'm the last shooter or something. I, I will, you'll see me. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see me sometimes if I have time, if I'm, uh, sh you know, down in the shooting order, you'll see me in the back of the, uh, the bay. I'm kind of look like I'm dancing around, like doing these, I don't know, these ballet moves. Cause I'm going through it mentally. I'm going through the movements in my head and I'm transitioning to the different targets. I'm taking the steps needed, um, for the stage. I'm just, I'm rehearsing it, um, in my head. So when I actually get to the stage and shoot it, I'm not really thinking about anything because I've already done all that. I'm looking at my site hmm. and calling my shots. And that's all I'm really doing. Yeah. So you go into it way more in depth than I do. <laughs> so, it's taken me a long time to get there. Yeah. So for me, it's pretty much when I'm looking at something, I'm already looking at the middle of the target. Now, all the time, wherever you look at, because you're doing a transition and you're trying to be fast, so you might catch that C zone or that D zone and not necessarily yeah. the alpha zone sometimes. But yeah, yeah, it happens. Yeah. So for me, the process, everything you said is pretty much the same minus visualizing the A zone. Because, <laughs> you know, I just pretty much look at a target and then wherever I'm looking at on the target, I'm automatically looking at the middle but now if it is a partial or something with hardcover blocking mm -hmm. it a little bit i do like really focus and take my time on the trigger you yeah know? so it isn't just like an open target where you just pop 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 and then you move on but as soon as i see that partial or that no shoot now i'm just making sure everything is straight so i don't get that penalty point yeah well no that's that's another critical part that I, I didn't mention when you're looking at the targets you i i like i kind of have like three different sight pictures and and a couple different trigger pull techniques that i that i utilize depending on what the target difficulty is and that's something that that i also try to go through when i'm looking at targets like this target's a difficult target it's a partial target 20 yards i have to pause i need to i need to make sure i prep that trigger and my sight still and i got a good clean you know smooth trigger pull 
I can't be slapping the trigger, you know, like at a five yard open target or something like that. So that's, that's something I didn't mention, but yeah, I'm also thinking about that stuff when I'm going through, going through the targets also. Now, just hearing that portion of the conversation and a lot of conversations we had beforehand, what do you think is three reasons that hold a lot of shooters back from one step forward? Um, I, mm, well, it, it made three reasons. You may give me three reasons. Is that what you said? You're right. Well, it, it could depend on, I guess, where you are as a shooter. Um, on what those reasons might be confidence I think is a huge one and, and that you know can come from a couple areas but I think it's mostly just comes from experience right. um, practice um, I know there are a lot of good shooters that a lot of guys that, that are friends of mine and I love shooting with them but they don't necessarily take the time and go out and practice on their own and, and live fire practice some of these some of these techniques and work on some of these things that would help them gain confidence. They're looking at these local matches as practice. And they are practice for shooting matches. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that you have you have to do. And, and it's a great way to get competition practice is shooting competitions and local matches is a great way to do that but you're while you're doing that you're not really focused on your trigger pull or, or, or I, I don't know whatever you know whatever it is you need to focus on your your sight picture your trigger pull your transitions or whatever that's not really what you're practicing at local matches and i think a lot of people look at them that way um and neglect the live fire practice mm -hmm. and really picking out, you know, one or two things to focus on in, in live fire practice. Uh, it, you know, you do it in dry fire also, but you really have to confirm what you're doing in dry fire with, with your live fire practice. Yeah. I think um, a lot I of, I don't it, know if that was that three things. I don't know. I think you did hit three. <laughs> so. It was lengthy, but I, th I think you did. We're going to say you hit it. Anyway. Okay. Um, I believe the number one contributing factor for somebody holding themselves back or not taking the next step for it is trusting within their ability, right? And yeah. which goes into yeah. like confidence. As confidence, you. yeah. And somebody can practice something and draw fire. They can think about it and they can amp themselves up to it. But when it's time to actually bring forth that skill set, they'll be like, well, hold himself back. Or they're just not willing to mm -hmm. take that chance to, all right, let me learn from a mistake. You know, so I think that's the number one contributing factor. The other one is, as you stated, was practice, both dry fire and live fire. And the two go hand in hand in a sense of speaking. Oh, they definitely do. They yeah. definitely do. I could sit in my living room all day, do six reload six and be like, Oh man, I did it in this amount of time, but I'm not equating for that. The recall that's going to assess with that split time as well. Yeah. And it is different. And if you, what you're doing in dry fire is fantastic. I mean, you're, you're developing your technical ability to manipulate the gun to find your sight picture, to, to work the trigger, um, you know, to get the mag out of your, out of your belt and get it back into the gun and get your gun back on target, your sight, sight picture back. And that you dry fire is the absolute best place to work on those skills. Yes. You're just wasting ammo. If you're going out and you're just trying to do that in, in live fire, mm -hmm. but <laughs> you do need to go confirm those skills just with a handful of rounds um, because there are a couple other variables, just this, the gun exploding, you know, going off in your hands. And then the, you know, the, the audio that you, you get from that and, and the visual, you know, aspect of it. A lot of, a lot of people I see um, new shooters will, 
their eyes will blink um, every time they pull the trigger or every time the gun goes off, you'll see, you'll see a lot of new shooters, their eyes are closed. Right. And that's not a terrible thing, but when you start looking at uh, shot calling, which is, it seems like it's kind of um, magic or some kind of <laughs> mysterious <laughs> thing for some people. Right. You, if you blink right when you, the shot goes off you can't call your shot because your eyes are closed (laughs) so just becoming comfortable with with the gun going off in front of your face um is a huge step and would hold a lot of people back the shot calling aspect of our sport is a tremendous it's a game uh, it's really yeah it's a tremendous step in, in gaining confidence and speed and accuracy and you know everything our sport requires you have to be able to call your shots and if you don't know what that is you need to call mike at m-w tactical and get a class with him <laughs> yeah, we can make that happen, we definitely make that happen. <laughs> the the third thing i think is a, a lot with holding people back is the ability to be honest with yourself you know, so mm, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. So a lot of people will go out to the range and they will do something, but then they will sit back and try to replicate what somebody else is doing. Well, now, like I stated beforehand, conversations that you and I had, I am a longer person than a lot of people, you know, <laughs> so for instance, Tim Heron can tell me to do something that works for him. And he can kind of break it down to possibly make that work for me. But why am I taking choppy steps being six foot five versus somebody who's five foot four? He's about half your height. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So hold on real quick. His last name is pronounced Heron, like, like the bird. Well, I always say Heron. Do you do it on purpose? Travis and I were talking about that the other night. Do you really do it on purpose? Yeah, I do it on, I do it on purpose. Okay. <laughs> well, that's that's great. I love yeah. it then. O- only because I, I never want to go ahead and call him um, like the drug. I don't want to like Tim Heron. <laughs> you know? <what> I'm <laughs> okay. Yeah, Tim doing Heron. What, what's we going were on? talking about, we weren't sure. We were talking about that the other night. We weren't sure. Said, He's got to be doing that on purpose. Yeah, yeah, I do Heron, it on sorry. purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. It's, it's, it's just like when I when I talk about you, like when I say your name to other people, um, I never say um, like Lyle, you know, I, like they, Lyle, you know, but it, you know, I do it on purpose. At least you don't add letters to it. Some people add letters. I never understood that. Yeah. L- Lydell. <laughs> yeah. I get that. I get that one a lot. There's no D in there. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but it happens though, but. <laughs> all right i'm sorry i didn't know no, you're good you're good, you good but um i say like the third one is to be honest with yourself because there are a lot of people that really honestly speaking they will pay for a class from somebody with the higher value name and then they'll pay for another class with somebody with another high value name and i'm more like you should let that sink in for a little bit in practice. So like, for instance, if you pay from a class from this person who is um, a professional or high skill level, that techniques that they taught you and everything, you should have been practicing and perfecting that over a six month time period before you take another class. Right. At least that's my way of thinking. Yeah. I mean, the, the time frame would vary depending on who you are, but yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, no. you would need to spend some significant amount of time on these techniques. I think it was um, Kita uh, Kita Bussy at one of the classes I took with her. I don't know if it was one that we took together or her first one I took in Florida, but um, she told us to expect to be worse. Yeah, she expect said, yeah. for your performance to be worse after this class. Right. Because you're you have learned a lot of new techniques. You're trying to implement these new techniques. You do not have them perfected yet. Mm -hmm. While you're trying to learn these new skills, these new techniques, you're going to be worse (laughs) at at your shooting. Your your performance is going to be less than it was before the class, Mm -hmm. which 
I completely agree with. I mean, you know, anytime you you start something new until you can you can develop your your comfort level with that skill, you know, whatever it is, um, you're going to struggle with it. Some um, our sport requires you to get these things, get these skills into your subconscious, to where you don't have you don't have to think about them. It's just it's just the way your body reacts to it, the way you do things. So when you're starting these new techniques that are not in your subconscious yet, you're going to suck at them. (laughs) You're you're not going to be very good at them. Your performance is going to be worse, but it's for the better. As long as you know, you, you, you're working with a a, a trusted instructor and you know, they're giving you the, the knowledge and skills that, that you need. Now I had a conversation with somebody two weeks ago and we were talking about that yeah and just like i told them nobody advances at the same skill level you know so you might get somebody that needs to dissect every moving piece where somebody might just understand the principle of and they just run off with it you know so yeah 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 however you can make it make sense to you that's how your skill set is going to be developed you know, overall. So I had trouble. I, I'm a slow learner, apparently. <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> what, and and our, that first class I took with Kita, mm-hmm. um, I don't remember. It was some. It was some lateral movement drill. I think we were doing. I don't remember the exact target array, but I was struggling with it just because it was a completely different movement than my body was accustomed to. Right. Just something. Yeah, I've been shooting for a couple of years, you know, before going into this class and it, my, I was doing what I was doing. My body was just doing what it was doing. And I really struggled with it. And, and, and some of the other students in class picked it up a lot quicker and I got really frustrated with it. I was like, ah. we, we took a lunch break and she was, she asked me, she's like, do you want to run the drill again? And I was like, no, did, there's no point in me even shooting rounds. I mean, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do this in dry fire. There's no point in me even pulling the trigger because I can't do this movement yet. So I did, I kept doing the movement like through lunch break and you know, I did it probably more than anyone else out there because I, I needed that. Right. The other people probably didn't need it for whatever reason. I don't, they picked it up quicker, whatever. I'm a slow learner, I guess, but I needed it and I didn't need to actually fire the gun to, because it was movement based you know I, was, I, I didn't really care about what the gun was doing um specifically i was working on this movement drill transitions and, and lateral movement stuff so it took me a lot longer more more reps um to get to where i needed to be or where, where i wanted to be compared to some other people in the class right so that's what my plan is going to be this weekend again is working on a lot of movement stuff. So I'm going to go out to the range and I'm going to set up a stage, put some targets out, but I'm not going to shoot rounds at them. And the only thing I'm just going to look at is my movement in and out of a position. But then at the same time, how am I leaving the position? Break it down so I can become more fluent coming in and out. Because I do notice a lot of times I do stand up more erect when I shoot. And then when I go to leave a position, just squatting down to get that burst of energy, that's like at least a half a second lost right there. So I'm trying to program myself to actually shoot lower, you know, so when I'm actually running, the weight is already there and all I got to do is lean and take You're already low. Yeah. So that's, that's the one thing that I'm focusing on right now. So um, I did a little bit of it last week. It kind of hurt. (laughs) <laughs> you know doing it it was newer to me so in your thighs in the front of your yes. front of your thighs yeah. yes so You'll feel um, the burn. yeah so now the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to mimic it this weekend but instead of it being in my backyard i'm going to actually go to the range take a bay um, take some walls out set up a little stage and just run it coming in and out of of a position until i feel comfortable with it you know so um but like I said, I'm getting ready for 2021 because 
when you sat there and said I had to chase um John Browning, I'm like, I ain't scared, but I'm gonna do it. <laughs> it seems like you should be able to outrun him because he's about half half your height too. Well, as I stated <laughs> beforehand, I believe that I am faster running straight line distance and maybe a cut or two here than a lot of people out there. Like majority of the people that we shoot with, I know for a fact I'm faster than them. But now once you put that firearm in my hand, I know for a fact I do too much thinking and that thinking slows me down, you know, because, okay, oh, yeah. throw your fingers out the trigger. Oh, don't break the 180. You know, I'm thinking too much about stuff instead yeah. of just letting my subconscious take over and I could just flow with it, you know? So I know that's what slows me down, you know? It, it absolutely does. And, and, and I think that's the, we're getting back to the like three things. I don't, that's the, the main part of our sport. What, whatever the, the three things may be. I don't, I don't know specifically, yeah. but it's going to be getting, for everybody. Yeah, it would be. But getting everything into your subconscious is, is the goal. Right. To where you don't have to think about movement. You don't have to think about trigger control. You don't have to think about sight alignment. You don't have to think about grip. Whatever the, the shooting fundamentals you need to start with. That's how you learn to shoot. You learn all those things. You learn your grip. You learn your side alignment. You learn what kind of trigger pull you need. You do all that stuff. Learn that. And then you learn the movement. Mm -hmm. And then you learn to combine them all together. And as Steve Anderson says, um, how does he say, how does he say it? You learn to shoot. You learn everything else. And then you shoot the targets. <laughs> <laughs> Simple concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, like that person that I was talking to um, not too long ago that I was talking about everything, as I told them, the easiest way for me to explain dry fire is the more you do dry fire, the less you got to think about that motion. So mm -hmm. for instance, once the timer goes off, the only thing I'm worried about once the timer go off is presenting the sights together, right? Cause that's You're not I'm, thinking oh, about the draw anymore. Yeah. I'm not thinking about it. I'm just, it just happens before I know it. Oh, wow. How did the firearm just get right there? You know? And then, um, once you understand that concept and you get used to that, now it might be looking at the targets, the transition from one target to the next target. Mm -hmm. And then once you get used to that, it builds on, it just ongoing and, yeah. You don't even realize you're doing it until somebody says something or you actually discover yourself and be like, wow, I remember how this was for me at first, but now I'm like this, you know? So that's a great, um, uh, I don't know what, what term I'm looking for, but it's a great point um, to keep a journal, right. start a journal with, with your shooting mm -hmm. um, example. I don't know the term I'm looking for, but it's late and I'm, just oh, got yeah. the heat back on because the oh yeah you're good heat went out it's 27 degrees outside <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah, you're good. but um i always try to keep a journal with things like that even with dry fire i've got i got two separate journals um my wife makes fun of fun of me and calls them my diaries um yeah. but that's fine you know whatever <laughs> <laughs> but I, I keep a dry fire journal, which is basically just um, times like part times and, and specific drills that I'm working on. We got from um, just different things I'm working on, but I also keep a journal for um, for my for the matches that um, we've talked about on a previous podcast. I think from season two, right. where we went through the um, the Steve Anderson's um, um, class, Steve Anderson's class that we did at Mid Carolina. Mm -hmm. and he inter introduced us to the journal that you know i've been sticking with it ever since and it is actually I, I wrote in it last night nice um so, like the next episode we do so next week's episode i want to talk about the journal and oh, okay you're gonna laugh <clears throat> at my journal <laughs> entries <laughs> you know my I, wife laughs at my well i don't know that she's ever read it or cares to read anything about it but so but we, that's what we're going to talk about here next week. But we're going to go ahead and um, get ready to bring forth Travis on the yeah. interview with him so we can actually get ready for that. Um, so I'm, I've am i been talking to Travis after our um, 
national championship we shot together and he's doing some some one-on-one -on -one training he's starting some uh you know it's like zoom meeting training he can do like one-on-one -on -one training for all sorts of things um he's got uh Video critique, mindset, movement, live fire, dry fire drills, match preparation, building a training plan, fitness and nutrition, which is the one that I have uh, contacted him about, and I'm I'm interested in that myself. We're gonna we're gonna develop a fitness and nutrition plan, kind of in general, but focused, you know, toward the the, the shooting sports and, and that sort of thing. So. He's real fitness and, and nutrition minded as well as everything else is being a world champion, multi-time world and national champion. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to doing that with him. You know, a lot of people, when they look at me and like they see all the physical stuff I do, a lot of people think I actually eat really healthy and I really don't. <laughs> you know you, you eat a bag of green frogs a day and... oh man <laughs> don't bring that up too loud <laughs> so my actual take on nutrition is is i look at it two ways right the first way i look at it is if you are someone who works out all the time and you don't eat properly i guess you can say what it comes down to is you have to understand if you don't eat right, you just have to work out twice as hard. But are you willing to make that sacrifice for that? The other way I actually look at it is if you have a sports car, like a Mustang or a Camaro, that's considered like a muscle car, sports car. Mm -hmm. If you put 87 octane in that car, <laughs> it's going to be knocking and it's going to run like, like smoke. It's going to run like <laughs> crap. Right. So, that's your fast food restaurants going into your oh, body. Oh man, that's a great example. Yeah, so, like I said, like that's how I used to talk to people when it comes to working out and what you're going to get, because you'll get a lot of people who are physically fit, but five minutes into whatever you're doing, whether it's basketball or even shooting, they're like, "Oh man, I'm like so exhausted. I'm tired." Yeah, that burger didn't carry you as far as you thought it. Would. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, but yeah, so let's, um, let's go and plan for that conversation next week. Go a little bit more depth into that as well. All right. All right. So let's get ready to bring Travis for it. Anything else you want to say to the good people to inform them of anything that's going on on your end? So we, um, just finished our last CSRA shooters match of the year. Um, in November, it was a fun match. Um, check check it out on YouTube. I did a little video of the match. Um, check out David Lyle at YouTube. Um, we also have registration open for the South Carolina State, or I'm sorry, South Carolina Section Championship 2021. Mike mentioned it at the beginning of the show, but check it out. Registration is still open. There's spots available for, um, I believe, maybe even Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, we're doing the AM, PM half day format. So um, everybody seems to love it. Check it out. You come shoot a major match, 10 stages in half a day. That's it. Um, so please go check it out. Come get signed up. If anything, we might have some people out there doing like Facebook Live, Instagram Live. Because I did hear through the grapevine that Brian Connolly from Hunter's HD Gold might be at the South Carolina section. He might make it. He so might schedule? make it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hope he, I hope he does. Yeah, that's what I said too. So, um, but um, this was a great week, like I stated, and now we got to get ready to get get ready to head out and talk. South Carolina sectional behind the scenes stuff, you know? So yeah. please everybody stay in your seats and here are a few words from our sponsors. Hi, this is Jesse Harrison and you're listening to the M-W Tactical Podcast. What's up good people. Thank you for taking the time and listening to the M-W Tactical Podcast. Please, Go visit the M-W Tactical store at www.m 
www.wtactical.com forward slash store and help support our efforts by purchasing a shirt or two. If you haven't done so, go follow us on Instagram and Facebook by searching for M-W Tactical. The Gun Cleaners. Our solvent is... I think second to none. Our lube is second to none. Their lube's heavier than water, which is just a huge thing. People don't really put a lot of thought into that, just how huge that is to have on your gun, especially if you can still carry. The gun cleaners. Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, you're going to sweat a lot of the other lubes off. With ours, it'll stay there. The gun cleaners. And maintaining the quality of the process, the quality of the end result is another, and you guys are able to do both with the process that you have there. Order your supply of the lube and the solvent at www.theguncleaners.com. I'm Jason Pratt, Masterclass USPSA shooter, owner of Brass Monkey Bullets. If you're interested in competition bullets, visit www.brassmonkeybulletsllc.com or call me at 423-967-1063. For more information, My email is BrassMonkeyBulletsLLC at gmail.com. Thank you. All right, good people. We're back at it again. And this week, we have an interview with someone who is a legend in my mind. I met this person many, many moons ago when I was in the military. When I first heard of him, I was impressed with the video I seen with how fast his reloads were. Literally, it was lightning fast. And I was like, what? No, that's some camera tricks. Let me watch that again. I watched it 20 times over to realize he was moving faster than technology at that time. But we all know him. We all seen him. And I do think this is probably the nicest guy in the gun industry overall. So without further ado, I want to welcome Travis Tomasi to the M-W Tactical Podcast. How's it going for you today, Travis? Hey, Mike. I'm great. I really appreciate that intro. That was, that was pretty cool to hear. Oh, man. Uh, like I said, I was at the range one day in East Alabama Gun Club there in um, the Fort Benning area. And one of the guys actually showed a video of you reloading. And the video was, once you hit the magazine release, you put the magazine in before the magazine even, like, was out of the frame. It, it was, like, remarkable. I was like, holy cow, man. I think that's some, some gimmick tree going on right there. <laughs> <laughs> but then um, when they actually said you and who you were and everything, and I did the research, and I was like, man, this guy really is lightning fast, you know? And that's awesome. I appreciate that. You know, it makes all the hard work. makes it worth it. Oh, man. Like I said, is <laughs> if people actually watch you shoot, you would actually be like downplaying it. But it really is an all moment when that happens, you know. So when did um you actually get involved with shooting? Well, it's been a long time now, but I uh, started in uh, 95. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So I've been doing it a long time. And it was I was I've been doing like team sports. Mm-hmm. And I was really lucky because my dad had been shooting Ipsic since like the early, like, well, like the mid eighties. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know what, why don't you come out to a match with me? I'll loan you my gear. And, uh, um, oh man, like the first, the first match, I was just completely addicted and obsessed with it. Right. And from that time on, I mean, I went from, uh, it's kind of funny cause I was last place in my first match, <laughs> 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 but I went literally from that to grandmaster in nine months nice so it kind of it shows you you know how i just was completely obsessed with technique and coming up with the best ways to do things and studying i would do you know dry fire four hours a day mm-hmm. on top of uh college and i was working at a a car dealership six days a week washing cars cleaning cars and stuff like that So I would find a way to fit four hours in there where I would just nothing but dry fire, you know, draws, reloads, uh, movement, strong hand, weak hand, whatever I could think of Mm. was just completely, it was, that was my whole life. (laughs) Oh, nice. 
So now, how did that transfer over to you actually joining the AMU? That's a, well, you know, it's interesting because in 97, so I started in 95. In 97, um, I actually met one of the coaches at the AMU. It was at Nationals, and I somehow made the Super Squad and Limited. I don't know how at that, you know, being that early in the game at, that happened, but he said, hey, if you're, if you're willing, would you like to go active duty Army? and I can get you a slot. Well, Mike, I wish I would have took up that opportunity right then. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I decided I want to try to do it, you know, the civilian way with sponsors. And I'd been talking to a few manufacturers at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it didn't come about until later. Uh, Max, Michelle, and I, we had made the open national team for the 2002 uh, world, world shoot, Ipsic World Shoot in South Africa. And it was, it was Jerry Barnhart, Todd Jarrett, Max, and I, I mean, this just, I was hugely honored to be part of that team. And Max, he said, well, why don't you come down to Fort Benning and train with me like a week or two, you know, before we leave for South Africa. And I, I took, I took him up on it and I kind of got a taste of, you know, the AMU, what it was like, you know, we'd go do PT in the morning and then we spend the rest of the day on the range. Mm -hmm. And there, unfortunately, there wasn't a slot available at that time, but I let them know. I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to, I, I want to be here. I want to be training with Max and I want to accomplish my goals. And so I waited probably another year or so before a slot came available. And that's pretty much how it happened. Oh, wow. That's, that's pretty remarkable. Cause you know, like how some people, they get recruited when they're like, 15, 16 years old, and then they keep following them until it's time for them to say, okay, we can make the commitment for the military. And then of course, once they get in the military, their career as far as shooting just blossoms after that. But yours is totally like, hey, not like the regular story. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it's totally different. Totally. And I was uh, 29, mm -hmm. I guess around 29. So an older guy going into the army. Right. Yeah, and you know, like even when I was a drill sergeant, you've seen that every now and then. Yeah. Like there was one guy specifically that stood out to me. He used to play for the Redskins, like their B practice team. Like that was his job. He was big. And I told him, I, you're about to lose a lot of weight, man, because you're not going to eat that much here in the military. <laughs> you know? No way. Yeah, he, he slimmed down, but he used to tell me some of the stories of like, how they used to talk smack and their training and how everything went. It was pretty remarkable, you know, wow, from that that's standpoint. Really cool. Yeah. So yeah, it's one of those type things. So now you actually went through AMU, you shot professionally with AMU and then you um, retired out the military. Then you started your shooting career. How did that work out for you? Because I know you mainly from Remington. Right. Because I was more like, yeah, he picked up Remington. That's my man right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, my uh, I'd followed like one of my but one of my big influences in shooting was um, Todd Jarrett. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially coming from that era, mid 90s, you had what we call the big three. It was Todd Jarrett, you know, Rob Latham and Jerry Barnhart, the burner. And those three guys basically won everything. And I guess, you know, having followed Todd, I was always keeping an eye on Para Ordnance, which became Para USA and when they moved to the States. But um, Todd was, was talking about retiring as a professional shooter for Para. Hmm. And, I, and, and my, my time in the Army, you know, my, cap, my contract was close to coming up. And I thought, wow, you know, it might be time to move on this because this has always been my dream to be a professional shooter and represent a, a manufacturer and, and do this for a living. I did it for the Army, which was right. amazing. And it was an incredible uh, opportunity to, to really, to, to really um, you know, build you in areas that you need to do that because you're representing the Army and that's your, your job is to promote the Army. Right. Um, but that came about and, and Todd was, was stepping down and I told, I, I let Para know, I let Todd know. I said, you know, I'd like to pick up that baton and, and carry it. And um, I was fortunate enough to get that opportunity. 
And so that was sort of my, my exit of the army into the uh, commercial and getting into the industry. And uh, it was it was really, really cool. I mean, I got to do more than just shoot, but I, you know, I did shoot for the company and I went to major matches and I did demos. Um, you know, I got to do this, the whole stage thing at SHOT Show and NRA, which was really cool because Todd had this, uh, a really good show that he put on with draws and reloads and a timer. And so, you know, it was now my time to do my own show and um, it was really cool. And then I was, I was brought into the business side and that I was, uh, you know, every, every week, I still lived around Fort Benning, Georgia, mm. but the shop or the, the, the plant was up in um, Charlotte, North Carolina, no Pineville technically. Right. And I would go up every week, every other week, I would go up and spend a week up there working in the plant and we'd work on products, you know, improving things. I worked a lot on, uh, you know, improving the parts like the extractor and, sites the finishes um i worked with customer service because and todd could attest to this but people tend to people that bought pairs would tend to go to the pro shooter he was like the face of the you know of the company and so they would come to me and that almost became a full-time job where i was 24 7 getting people you know taken care of mm -hmm. i would just have it worked out where i would send them new parts if i could diagnose it remotely which i could a lot of the time have a lot of experience with 1911s, obviously. Um, but uh, going forward, you know, that, that lasted for maybe, maybe really only six months or less than a year. And then Remington acquired Para. Mm -hmm. And I was like adopted, <laughs> mm -hmm. adopted in the process where for a while they ran Para as it's as a standalone brand and everything kind of was the same, you know, different management, whatnot, in some different directions. But eventually um, the Para brand was shut down and those models were rebranded as Remington's. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of transitioned from being Para shooter to Remington shooter. But at the same time, I was also a product manager and I was involved in literally every, just about every, um, every aspect of the business. It was a, it took me a lot away from shooting and it took my suffer, my performance suffered for it. I got to say, um, for a time, you know, for, for quite a while, but I, I learned so much while I was there. Mm -hmm. I learned, uh, just about, like I said, I worked with everybody, you know, marketing, public relations, production, engineering, a lot of, with engineering and the whole thing. It was a great education. Right. Absolutely. Right. So now you did all that backdoor stuff with Remington that nobody knew you was doing because you was pretty much just a face for shooting in the sense yeah. of somebody like me, because I did not know you was dealing with customer service. You had your hands in the manufacturing of parts, do this better. And Let's look at this from this perspective. But now, since Remington actually closed down, how did that affect you or did it affect you or did it even open more doors for you? Well, it absolutely, it was a major, um, it was a major change in my life. And um, it's, it's been positive mm -hmm. because it's allowed me to focus 100% now on what I want to do, which my passion is teaching and shooting and competing. I mean, that's, that's what I live to do, you know, just, just thinking about it, I get, I get excited. And I'm, I'm um, so it's allowed me that opportunity to refocus on those areas and open up some other opportunities. I'm not pushing really hard to gain other sponsorships. If, if a, there's a relationship that were to um, come about that I think would be great beneficial for everybody I would definitely be open to that mm -hmm. but I'm really focused more uh, now on teaching and and then going to more matches if I can when I have the opportunity and um, so it's really exciting but it's been a it's been a major change because that was Remington well I was a full-time employee and there was in being involved in so many different aspects and doing so many, like I was doing trade shows, 60 plus trade shows a year. And that doesn't include, you know, include the big ones like shot and NRA, 
things of that nature. I was doing running wholesale shows, um, you know, distributor shows. And then, you know, I'd go from there and then go shoot a match. You know, there really wasn't a lot of practice or any training going on. Wow. Um, <laughs> I might bring my stuff and dry fire. I'd be at the show, like, you know, writing orders, big orders, ammo and guns. And then I would pick up a, you know, a 1911 or something and do some dry firing and then <laughs> back to work. <laughs> wow. It, it was, it was quite the lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, did it bother you that, that took away from your shooting performance or were you just having fun overall? So in the beginning it started, it was fun. It was mm. different. I thought that I was adding value to myself as being more than just a shooter. Mm. Like this is a guy we can use to do. I mean, I'm training, I'm training the sales staff. I'm doing, you know, all these different functions and and it was exciting because every week I was doing something different. It's like, well, what do you do? Well, I don't report to the same desk every day. I may be on the road or I may be working with consumers or whatever it may be. That was really exciting. And then there's this little, there's this little voice in the back of your head and you had to listen to your heart where it's like, my passion is shooting and my passion is teaching. That really is what, that's what I want my life to be. And this, I've allowed this, it was, a cho it's all choices. I believe life is all choices. You have the choice to continue doing what you're doing, or you, you have the choice to change. And at some point it was, it was, it was, I was like, this isn't exactly what I want to do the rest of my life. I want to get back to focusing on my passions. Okay. So now did you realize your passion for teaching came from your time at AMU, meaning the Army Marksmanship Unit, because we didn't express that at the beginning. Oh, yeah. For people who don't know. But did you realize your passion for teaching picked up there or did it hit someplace else in your career? Mike, that's an awesome question, because go, go, if we go back to 95 and I had this super fast like rise in the sport mm -hmm. and and I was in uh, I was in Washington State. That's where I came up. Right. And so I was winning all these matches in Washington, Oregon, some in California. And about probably by the end of that year, I was getting solicited by people, shooters being like, hey, can you come and teach us a class? Mm -hmm. And you got to remember back then we didn't have the Internet. There wasn't mm -hmm. all this information available online. There are a few of the top guys were teaching. Um, not everybody, not like now. Right. And so the first, my first response was, whoa, you know. So far, all I've done is worked on me, you know, right. building myself. Mm -hmm. And I took it as an opportunity. First, I was flattered, like, wow, these guys want to learn from me. But the next part I had to do was figure out how to translate what I have learned for myself and, and be able to teach that to somebody else. And I will tell you that that is when the passion really, I went, this is amazing. Not only am I able to see people get better, mm -hmm. which is incredible but and have and be a part of that but when you it's interesting the more you teach the more it helps you as well right and the more it yeah more that affirms maybe what you've learned about certain techniques and it makes you take another look and maybe you find better ways to do things so i would say it really started that early for me and then for a while i wasn't teaching i was really working on trying to get to win nationals basically was my goal before the army. Right. And so I was really focused basically on, you know, I was working and shooting. So and all my money from work went to ammo, to travel, supporting this dream that I had right. and getting back into the AMU, the army marksmanship unit, it was like, Oh, so part of your job is going to be teaching. Awesome. Cause that's what I love. Mm -hmm. And I got to work on it even more. And, and, you know, and you'll know, you know, from working with soldiers and and when working soldiers all over the army and different units and, and, and different uh, MOSs and different grades and all this, that it really gave me a lot of good of ex good experience. So long way to answer your question, but it started really early, and then the army uh, was able to let me take it to way another level. Yeah, and you know, not to joke on you or anything. When I look at you as someone who is training someone, especially if you was to see that person out of match doing something and they're doing everything right, 
I can see you on the sideline running next to them, like, keep it going, keep it going. Go, go, go. <laughs> yes. I can actually see you doing that because it actually it flows off of you that you actually are genuine when you say you want to see people get better. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It really, it's really, I, I would say that I put it in the same, if not greater than the feeling of winning. Right. Yeah. Because it's like, and then I've seen the people that I've taught win, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then, or just accomplish their goals. It may not always be winning, but, and I don't care if they give me any credit, I, just to know that I was, I was part of that and uh, gives some meaning to this because it has taken a lot of, a lot of time to get where I'm at now. A lot mm-hmm. of, a lot of blood and sweat. <laughs> right. So what actually ended up taking place, because I ran into you at nationals. And you shot on the um, same squad with Dave. And Dave is the co-host of the podcast as well. And I opted not to be on the same squad because I got this belief that if you shoot with the same people who you shoot with all the time, you're not going to challenge and push yourself like you will if somebody else different was there. You know, but I was kicking myself the whole time. And I was like, man, I could have actually shot on the squad with Travis. <laughs> and <laughs> that could have been somewhat of, okay, remember when I did this, how would you analyze this or, you know, help out a little bit or something to that effect. But then I was like, well, no, because it will work out later because eventually we're going to talk about training, which yeah. we have been. You know, so I was more like, okay, I I think it worked out better for me, but it worked out more awesome for Dave. But we both came up with the conclusion that we want to link up with you and actually do some training with you. And that's great. I really enjoy hearing that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So like I said, it's for me, it's all about gaining the knowledge. And I do believe a lot of it. All of us, we put too much thought into it. And I realized this about myself, just like I told you last week when we was talking. I believe I think too much when I shoot. And that's what's holding me back a lot. Absolutely. (laughs) So that's just to sum it up in a nutshell. But once I get past that, figuring out to stop myself from thinking and just let my subconscious take over and just let it run. Absolutely. The conscious mind is... When you compare it to the subconscious, it's so it has so much less horsepower. You know what I mean? Right. It, it, it's slow in comparison. It can really only focus on one thing at a time effectively, and it doesn't multitask well. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you found that this conscious thought it's really restricting you, right? It's it's mm-hmm. restrictive in nature, and a lot of it comes down to trust, where we've got to trust that our subconscious is going to do what we want it to do to carry that out. Right. And um, I think that's great that you're able to to like self-diagnose, mm-hmm. you know, and analyze yourself and say, hey, this is this is holding me back because I, I believe you're exactly right because I know because I've been there. Right. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, it's just as long as you're honest with yourself, that's the only way you're truly going to get better. Right. Only but, way. Yeah. Only way. <laughs> but you have to make those changes. And it's just like anything else. Like when you talk to somebody who is a troubled youth or somebody who did something that was challenging for them, you have to want that change to come in order for the progression to happen. You know, that's everything in life. (laughs) It is. It's so, it's so true. And some people expect to, well, you know, I listened, I listened to this class or, or I listened to some tips and, you know, I'm going to be better, but don't you, you really, it doesn't work that way. You, like you said, you have to decide you want to get better you have to have that desire and you're going to have to put some effort in. Yeah. That's what it comes yeah. down to. So now you actually offer training full time now. So you want to talk about that and how people can reach out to you and explain your concept when it comes to training and teaching? Yeah, please. So you can get a hold of me at travisdemossi.com is a good way to do it. And so I'm teaching uh, group classes typically a two-day class. Um, Typically, it's 10 to 12 students, but I also do smaller group classes. I can do one-on-one, and I'm also now doing online training over Zoom 
where an hour at a time where you can decide what we're going to work on. Um, you can send me videos so I kind of see where you're at. And then, but I do like to narrow that focus down so we, we can stay focused. The hour goes by, it can go by fast. And I, I like to put out a lot of information. So um, I think that's another good way to connect with people, especially if we get locked down again. Don't know how, you know, how that's going to work out and our future is sort of uncertain. Um, but I, I'm, I'm really loving, you know, group classes and being able, to, being able to do it live and be there and offer also customized training. If somebody's like, look, I really want to focus on these aspects of the game, then I can put a class together for, for that in that respect. And if not, if it's my general two day performance pistol class, then we are really going to get into everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm not one to, to have you shoot until your hands are bleeding or have you do, you know, a thousand reps in, in front of me. Once I see that you have an awareness and that you can like self-diagnose or self-correct to me, it's time. Okay. That's great. It's time for us to move on to new material. And you can take that. Once you can self-diagnose, you're like, okay, I'm coming into this position wrong. You know, with the wrong foot, I'm presenting the gun late. And I can hear you say that as soon as you do it, or I can ask you, I'm like, okay, we're, we're probably ready to move on. And we don't need to spend this massive volume of ammo to where you're sore the next day. You know, you're, you got band-aids on and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather you be almost more mentally fatigued from trying to process a good bit of information that you're going to have to use in the future. Right. where you can take it back and then you can spend as many reps as you want working a given technique until you're like, well, I'm, I'm great at this, mm -hmm. this technique, I'm, I'm capable of winning with this. Um, but you have it, you know, you get, in my opinion, I can put out more info that way, which is what I want to do. I want to also give you something, each person, regardless of the size of the class to know what they need to work on going forward and their priorities of work what they need to focus on. So, and to me, it just sounds like you're now a personal coach in the shooting aspect. Yes, I think that sums it up perfectly. Yeah, so. Yeah, well said. Now, now when you actually say you do the video, do you actually break down video of somebody of them shooting and say, okay, look at this, let's talk about this. What were you thinking? Possibly all something to that effect. Yes, exact. That's absolutely. Hmm, okay. So that's very much so. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. So I would actually encourage people to look up how you actually shoot, find conversation like a past interview, and then dissect it. And you will understand everything he's saying in a short sense of speaking. It's mind blowing if you look at it from the concept of shooting like that you know so wow so but you also made a point that you're not really looking forward to any other sponsors because you want to dive into shooting head on right yes so um the freedom to do um to, to focus on my my basically my own teaching my own shooting and then i'm, I'm definitely open um to to like i said you know really uh, that in a way that I could help them and, and then they could help me. Um, mm -hmm. I would definitely be open to that. And it, I'm, I'm really into interested in quality, something that's going to be what I want to use, you know, maybe some ammo that I would use that. That's what I'm going to buy anyway. Well, mm -hmm. I can represent you and, and help you help you on that end. Okay. So now you being an instructor are you planning on doing anything like, um, I won't say like an alumni thing, but almost like um, you'll probably do something like a week long training, whereas a match might be included in there or something? Yes. Yeah. That's, um, I've been approached with that. Some people are very interested where to sort of like, you know, include a, a, a match together with the training. Mm -hmm. And they typically want to do, uh, you know, a couple of days of training, and then we would go shoot the match together. Um, or, you know, or even if, 
even even on a on a higher level, maybe I have enough help or enough people that we can build our own match and then um, do that as well, sort of dovetail it along with the class. Oh, yeah, nice. I'm very open. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a, I like the thought of that also. I like how that sounds. So now this is a part of the show because whenever we bring on like the higher class professionals on the club on the show. I like to bring up a video and have you dissect the video of what you think and performance wise, uh, just a true assessment of what you see. And it's one of the stages I've done. So this is a stage that I've done last, it was two weeks ago at Spartanburg. And this is the final stage of the day. But at the same time, I think this was the best stage that I had. All right. So this is that video. All right. Let me turn the volume on. All right. So now before you say anything about the video, yeah. what actually ended up taking place during my um my stage walkthrough, my plan was not to run all the way far into that corner as okay. I did. I was supposed to stop at a certain point where I could see those two targets that I engage right here. Yes. But then I could just traverse and hit those four targets right here. Execute my reload. And then right here, it was still two on paper and then two on the drop turn, turn around and it was paper and then still also. Awesome, Mike. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit choppy for me. Okay. One thing I'm gonna, one thing I like, okay, I'm gonna tell you one thing that stands out to me here, good. I like the width of your stance. Mm -hmm. So what I like to use is a wider than shoulder width stance. Right. Um, Non-firing foot is forward, more of a fighting stance. You mm -hmm. know, you're a fighter, so Right. You have an idea what I'm talking about. Correct. Um, you got you, your knees are bent. I like that. Uh, one thing I will one thing I will look at is when do you present the gun coming into these? These are what I call blind acquisitions. So mm -hmm. you can't see the target basically until you're in position. Mm -hmm. um, versus versus, you know, a normal transition, let's say, where the targets are all out in front of you, the array, these you have vision barriers, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna you're not gonna see the target till you're in position. But the key here is to have the gun up ready before the target is available. Not too early though. You too early, it starts to slow your forward momentum or your lateral your your lateral speed. Um, so what I'm looking for though is to have the gun up and ready just before the target appears. And what I mean the target appears, you've got the gun up maybe on the side of the, the vision barrier. Your vision is up, you're hunting for that target. Your, your movement carries you into that window. The target is exposed. You're ready to shoot as soon as like an inch of the target is available. Of course, you're gonna wait for the A zone, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you wanna have that, that, that desire and that uh, preparedness to have the gun ready to go. And that's a huge time waster for people. They come into position and then they present the gun too late. Right. So the video is a little choppy for me. I can't see perfectly. Um, that was a great transition right there. Yeah, yeah I good. think that, that was my best stage run of the day because this was the final stage okay that was a, a new firearm for me um the brazos custom oh, yeah. and at this point i've had it for two days wow yeah so <laughs> um my sti i was running a five pound trigger in the sti so instantly i went to 2.5 50 percent reduction on the trigger and i'm sitting there getting used to it and the last stage i was just, let me just throw it out there, see what happens, just try to run it as hard and conscious as I can. 
and I ended up um, with a seven, I think it was a seven, two hit factor on that stage. And awesome. the guy who was the RO, I was trying to pace him all day because he's an A-class shooter, um, okay. Rob Ravina. And when I was pacing him, I'm like, okay, I'm slowing myself down, but I'm hurting myself more. But I was just being more cautious because of the new gun, right? So I wasn't opening up, but I was pulling myself back and really trying to get a feel for the gun, understand the gun. And then the last stage, I was just like, forget it. I'm just going to do it. You know, and it actually yeah. happened on the last stage. <laughs> it looked real good. Like I said, the video was choppy. So there was, I was sort of missing some of the stuff. Right. Um, but I could tell, you know, you were gripping it good. And mm. um, you look like your splits and transitions were on point. Um, so I think I would say that that gun jives with you pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> you know, I love it. It's a little bit heavier too than the STI. But I think that weight. It, it helps with the shooting and complements it once you understand how it works hand in hand with each other. And isn't it funny? So you would say that that was your, um, your best stage of the day. Correct. And mentally, what did you do different? Just picked up a, I don't give a crap attitude. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, all this superfluous info and all this, um, these concerns and our conscious thought it's a limitation. And you were able to say, you know, I'm not going to worry about what he's going to do here. I'm not going to pace him. I'm just going to go out there and drive the gun. Right. And from what I could see, it looked awesome. Yeah. And even like when I was shooting it, when I came in on that steel, because I kept telling myself steel paper drop turn and majority of everybody on the squad was skipping the drop turn because it was a no mic penalty, you know, um, or no penalty mic. Yeah. So I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to hit everything. <laughs> and nice. actually, that's what I actually ended up doing. And even after I ran the stage, to sum it up the same way how you said it, if I would have presented the firearm as to where the target was and by the time it exposed and it came on the trigger, I felt like that would have been better. But I made that assessment like two days after when I was looking at the videos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay though you you yeah. you know you you did tune into it and that's the big thing right and yeah uh, i love hey, the, the being able to self-diagnose is huge yeah and my whole thing is when i look at my videos i try to figure out a way how i can become faster you know and me and dave we talk all the time and i necessarily you don't have to be on the trigger faster it can be I'm a firm believer getting in and out of, 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 of a position, but then at the same time, as you said, taking advantage of something as simple as lining up the, the firearm to the target behind a barrier. And as soon as it exposes itself, get on that trigger. Right. Yes. And that can save up like milliseconds right there. But at the end of the match, those milliseconds make seconds save in the end. Exactly. They add up. Yeah. And um, there's, you know, so many opportunities like that all over, all over these stages where we can save time. And, um, you know, speaking of Dave, that's, he's a great shooter mm -hmm. and a great student of the game. I really enjoyed shooting with him. And I think it's cool that you guys are bouncing this stuff off of each other. Right. And I think that's a great, um, it's really cool when you, when you have, you know, buddies that can that you all can have that. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And he's actually one, when he sees something, he'll just tell you straight up, Hey, this is what I see. Just think about it, but don't focus on it right now. Stick to your game. We'll talk about it later. I <laughs> that's how that. he is. <laughs> yeah. He's, I, I was really impressed with Dave. Get in. I was really, I felt fortunate that um, I was squatted with him. It was, it was <laughs> yeah. really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and it's like I said, um, I really do enjoy shooting with him. And I still remember the first day I shot with him. I've seen a bunch of videos, but just seeing him shoot in person compared to the videos, it was like, wow, man, this is awesome. <laughs> this is yeah, awesome. exactly. <laughs> and then, like I said, conversation just started slowly but surely after that. And then we just vibe and then we are where we are today. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. So where do you see Travis Tomasi in the next five years? So, you know, expanding, expanding my teaches, teaching business for sure. 
and uh, just driving on and, and accomplishing more of my goals in shooting, which are, um, you know, to regra- regain my nationals and world titles. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to doing that. And I'm not going to let anything get in my way. And uh, I want to learn along with my students. And, and uh, we all together, we can achieve our goals. And hopefully this, <laughs> our environment and our government doesn't get in the way and we can continue doing what we need to do. Oh, yeah. So hopefully, as we stated, if everything pans out the way we want it to, we do plan on bringing you to Columbia, South Carolina to give your two-day class to share the knowledge with us so we can all fulfill our dreams and getting better in the sport of shooting. But I am actually looking forward to when this will actually take place. So for everybody who's listening, just stay tuned. If you don't follow the M-W Tactical Facebook page, Follow it now and stay tuned to the information we're going to put out for the future class that's taking place with Travis Tomasi. So we just got to work it out on the calendar and um, polish it out and then signups will happen, you know? So how can the good people reach out, follow you, subscribe, all that good stuff to actually talk with Travis Tomasi? Absolutely. Well, please go to travistomasi.com. You'll have links there to my Instagram and my Facebook you can always email me at Travis at TravisTomasi.com as well. And um, I'd love to hear from you. If you've got any, you know, anything specifically I can help you with or just general information, I would, I would love to talk with you and love to have that opportunity. Hey, like I said, I'm all aboard for it. And I'm going to take advantage of all this um, connections of training because I'm a I'm a bug for it. Now I, I want to absorb everything I can. <laughs> Good man. Right, but, um, but we do want to thank you for coming on to the M-W Tactical Podcast. And for everybody else, please stay in your seats. And here are a few words from our sponsors. Are you in the market to purchase your first or next firearm, but find the atmosphere of a gun store intimidating, crowded, or uninviting? There's a way for you to purchase the gun you want while avoiding the crowds, the gruff salesmen, and the marked up prices that come with a brick and mortar gun store. The process is called a transfer, where the purchase is made in an online store and sent to a federally licensed middleman called an FFL, who processes the paperwork and background check for a firearm purchase. CAE Transfers is the FFL with the lowest transfer cost in the Midlands at only $20 or $15 with the presentation of a South Carolina concealed weapons permit and $10 for repeat customers. If you live in Columbia, South Carolina, or its surrounding areas, choose CAE Transfers as your FFL during checkout and let me help you complete your online gun purchase. You can find and follow CAE Transfers online at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using at CAE Transfers. Thank you for your business, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Hey, this is Brian Conley at Hunter's HD Gold. If you've never tried Hunter's HD Gold, then I challenge you to find me at a match next year. Go to the website under scheduled events, find out where I'm going to be. Come meet me in person and demo a pair for yourself. Find out why shooters across the United States are changing to Hunter's HD Gold to get 43% more light to their eyes, better contrast, eyes that are not fatigued at the end of the day based on the, the colors that we use, and find out the real meaning of why they change so you don't have to. So check us out on our website, huntershdgold.com, and I look forward to seeing you at the range soon. The Gun Cleaners. Our solvent is, I think, second to none. Our lube is second to none. Their lube's heavier than water, which is just a huge thing. People don't really put a lot of thought into that, just how huge that is to have on your gun, especially if you can still carry. The gun cleaners. Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, you're going to sweat a lot of the other lubes off. With ours, it'll stay there. The gun cleaners. And maintaining the quality of the process, the quality of the end result, is another and you guys are able to do both with the process that you have there order your supply of the lube and the solvent at www.theguncleaners.com thank you for taking the time to hang out with us on the m-w tactical podcast remember a new podcast comes out every tuesday if you can't wait for tuesday go listen to past episodes to catch up on what you missed 
make sure you visit www.m-wtactical.com and see what all is offered on the site where you can even purchase M-W Tactical apparel. But please, go to our Facebook and Instagram page and follow us on our journey in the sport of competition shooting and the realm of the two-way community. Until next week, keep shooting, keep practicing, and have fun.